League games again. And since I promised last time, we're going to start with my long running game against Sotokahu, the one outstanding game I have from the first round of the league. It's a little while since we discussed this game. The USSR fell in 1942 in a historical defence, but the UK managed to hold on in the Middle East, just a hex or two in Kuwait and of course Gibraltar. And now the tide has begun to turn. The Axes are not going to dislodge me from Kuwait, but I need to establish the initiative and gain control of Africa, to shift the strategic warfare bonuses and to regain the UK factories. And I need to do that in 1943 with just one allied faction. I think a lot of players view that as very difficult and it's not easy and that tends to lead to a lot of resignations following a USSR collapse in the historical defence. So it's worth spending some time talking about this because Sotokahu is not a weak player and I don't manage to achieve this due to a series of blunders on their part but I do manage to do it by the end of 1943. My first effort in that direction is to station a US fleet in Cyprus in the hopes of damaging Axis supply routes, which Sotokahu counters by spending the Axis surprise marker to take the island. Okay, spend the surprise marker to take Cyprus makes sense, but I'm pleased with having drawn it. It removes the marker as a threat to the UK, Malta or Gibraltar. By February, the British are firmly ensconced at Malta and are beginning the process of grinding down Italian supply. It will take a while for this to become effective, but Malta can also serve as a staging point for an invasion of Africa, requiring the Italians, Turks and Germans to cover three potential avenues of attack. The first avenue of attack is Iraq, because I still control Kuwait. And it's worth saying a little about this position. In fair weather, a successful attack on the Nor unit in dangerous third panzer. If it retreats to the northeast, it blocks third panzer's retreat. And if it retreats northwest, I can follow up with eighth armor, also cutting third panzer's retreat and isolating it. I also have the chance of achieving a DD on the infantry unit, which carries additional risks for the German forces. Note that this is a very general point. This defense would actually be stronger if it were held solely by third panzer and the Nor unit were located at Hex 5260 as a fallback. Not that I get any great successes in Iraq, and by March the Axis forces are beginning to build up. There are now two German panzers and two German infantry available. I am holding on to Gibraltar, and that keeps the supply open into the Med. So it's now time to open up a second front. And just to be clear, the reason I'm holding on in Gibraltar is because I've taken the trouble of stationing a full strength unit in the fort, which is incredibly difficult for the Axes to dislodge. I have two options with a landing from Malta, the undefended Tripoli or the undefended Benghazi. Benghazi is in principle a lot better. It would allow me to then take Tripoli, but it comes with a substantial risk. If you land at Tripoli, Aircraft carriers can be used to attack the Italian fleet in Sicily and the landing is guaranteed to succeed. If you land at Benghazi, you can't carry out airstrikes against the Italian fleet because it's in a different sea zone to the surprise marker. And in this scenario, I favoured the conservative landing at Tripoli, which I could guarantee to get in. The Germans did counter that and they managed to drive the American troops out of Tripoli with a panzer jeopardizing my landing. But here I take a chance to save the position and play another surprise marker, landing a garrison unit to surround and isolate Tripoli, giving my US armor three shots to destroy the unit, which it does and break out of the original landing zone and push east. Still no progress around Kuwait, even in July. Well, one hex, but basically no progress. I've got a plus two DRM here and only need two consecutive retreats, then I can dump the partisans and airdrops on the panzer to create a breakthrough. But I just don't get them. Time to start stressing the Axis supply lines. I dropped a surprise marker into C-Zone 26 and took out both convoys with an aircraft carrier strike. 
Then I used the bomber to smash the Italian naval forces at Tobruk. This won't stop Axis supply next turn, but if I take Alexandria, then I can position an interceptor that can break up any runs. Or I can take Rhodes to do the same thing, which is harder for the enemy to retake and threatens Turkey. I've not played this quite as precisely as I should have, but it's solid progress so far. August, and I'm moving the garrison by strategic move to northwest of my American armor on the road from Benghazi to Tobruk. I have a full strength US unit. There is a single German infantry blocking and the Tobruk fort is currently empty. I have a plan in mind here, which is why I just spent the strategic move doing this. Feel free to pause the video and you can see if you can work out what the possibility is. If the German unit falls back to the Tobruk fort, and I think that's the best option available to Sotokarhu, then it will no longer exert a zone of control. So I will be able to move the US armor to southeast of Tobruk and it will still be able to draw supply. Also threaten to take Alexandria on the next move. However, that doesn't effectively invest the fort. So the German unit would be able to leave and capture Benghazi if I had not blocked the road. By strategic moving the garrison, I forced the German unit to move through two hexes of rough ground. and It does not have enough movement points to then take Benghazi and disrupt my supply lines. A disastrous problem for Sotokahu here. They routed through C-Zone 25 instead of using the straits to C-Zone 27 and the British fleet managed to intercept all supply attempts. The German infantry did not occupy the fort, which means it can be attacked and forced into an isolation position. These I think are both interface problems. You can manually direct the route of fleets, but it's fiddly and occasionally the computer will route a fleet that could avoid interceptions along a route that allows it to be intercepted. This probably breaks the Axis med position and puts me into a winnable, but still definitely not winning endgame. The med position would have broken anyway, but this accelerates it. And it's worth saying it's been possible because I prevented a med lock by holding on to Gibraltar with a full strength unit and keeping a toehold in Basra. First I do this. I attack Tobruk from the southwest. Then, rather than take it, I move to the east to pin the Axis unit in the elbow. I can take the fort itself next turn. Next, I use a US surprise marker to take Rhodes. That will complete the stranglehold on supply. But I get zero in Iraq, despite the low supply on the Panzer 316643554, in case you're interested. I've had swings on the dice both way in the med, but I've not had a single good break in Kuwait. Sotokahu keeps the fighting up, sending 4th Panzer to defend Alexandria. My convoys are under considerable strain at the moment. There is very little risk to the Axes here, and they're tying up a lot of Western units and resources. If they can hold on long enough, then it becomes actually hard for me to organise for Overlord in 44. And of course, they head off in any invasion of Italy or the soft underbelly in general. Using the strategic move to use, send 4th Panzer to defend Alexandria means that Smyrna is going to fall to my landed garrison at Rhodes. In Iraq, Sotokahu abandons the defence south of Baghdad. I'm a little doubtful about this. It lets the British units into the desert zone where weather will not slow them down and it's September 43 so we're beginning to get into the bad weather. I think I would have held this in the hope of getting into that bad weather and maybe holding on to Iraq for a couple of extra months. In October, Sotokahu gives up on North Africa entirely and diverts troops back to contain the situation in Turkey. It's otherwise a fairly dull turn. It will take me a few months to take the various cities and then I'll need to start reorganising for D-Day and make a decision on whether I press on in Turkey in the bad weather or lay any plans against Italy. The Moscow Treaty ends promptly at the end of the year, so now we are firmly into the... and so now we're entering the end game. Allies will need a spectacular summer offensive and they will need to lay some serious groundwork for that in the next few months to be in with any chance of victory. 
and we'll take a look at that in future episodes. A quick reminder, this game against WKSP is a long opening and one of the hopes for the Axes in a long opening is that they will have good diplomacy. I'm not having much luck with that. Finland activated with the Soviets and a political failure forced me to invade Yugoslavia, which is quite historical. That's basically what happened to Yugoslavia in the Second World War. I got Turkey, but I did not get Sweden, which I would often hope for. Anyway, it tends to get a bit dull here in a long opening because I don't need to invade the USSR until 1941, which I ultimately do in May 41. There's not a lot of tactical nuance to an invasion of the USSR in a long ago. Victory is inevitable. Um, so this particular challenge here, you feel free to pause the video and take a look at it, is a rules question. There are three air units involved in the attack. When I try to move one of them away, west of Minsk, the BGA enforcement goes loopy and demands I'm trying to break the home defence limits. Can you work out why? Feel free to pause the video and give it a moment's thought. For those of you who have spotted the fighter in Bessarabia, well done for your excellent knowledge of minor USE rules. Yes, in a long opening, Bessarabia cannot have been ceded because there is no ceding of territory if you go after the Soviets first. So that unit is not actually contributing to the eastern component of home defence. It is the free floating fighter and that means I can't move the fighter west of Minsk away until I've moved the fighter in Bessarabia to a position where it's contributing to eastern home defence. Here we get two elements of counterplay. Ulu is open and one of my objectives is to take Finland out of the war which is part of why I moved slightly early in this game. I would probably have waited to July otherwise. WKSP's response is to try and take Turkey out of the game in order to deprive the axes of an ally in the end game. And that is where the Soviet effort is concentrated rather than against the invading Germans. After all, he knows no matter how much of a defence the Soviets put up, they're not going to stop the Soviet collapse in January 1942. The Turks take a hammering and I get a solid foothold in Ulu. There are a lot of small imprecisions in the play here, which is hardly surprising. Precise play comes as the product of seeing positions over and over again. And while both of us know the basic theory of the opening, these positions are essentially all new to us. For example, don't leave an open port in Finland. And that position I deployed in for the Turks was not good. It basically just gave away to national will. Oh, and of course, I missed the possibility that on the next turn we might get poor weather in the cold zone and foolishly didn't save three production points for the convoy, thinking the German troops would be able to take a Finnish city in the next round. The absurdity of play in the long war is illustrated by this frontline position. The Soviets are refusing to defend cities and the Axis are refusing to take them. Look at Rzhev. It's literally wide open and I could walk an Axis unit into it and I'm sitting on the other side of the river and refusing to do so. This is probably the first USE game long opening that's ever been played between two players who went in with an understanding of the strategic and tactical implications of the opening. WKSP is playing defense here and has played defense against me once before in a long opening. And it's becoming rapidly apparent that the defense is even more absurd and gamey than the attack. And the attack becomes even more gamey in response. And just to be clear, neither of us is playing particularly competently. I'm shockingly unimpressed with how poor my own play is. I moved too early, an undefended Moscow is clearly a trap, my fighters are in the wrong place, and I just clicked a plus three DRM attack. Absolutely something an Axis player should never do at this point in the long opening, because a plus three DRM attack risks a DE result, and thus a point of national will, and thus triggering the collapse too early. But better play is not going to make this look less absurd. And there's going to be five months of this. 
For example, in this position around Moscow, I am refusing to attack the Soviet unit that is out of supply and stuck behind my lines. Instead, I'm starving it to death. The Soviets have two national will, and I want to save one of those to kill a shock army if it's built in Minsk, which is the city I'm holding for my sting in January. The sting is the attack that takes place in the Russian winter at the beginning of January in order to finally collapse the Russians. And essentially what you do is you completely surround but don't take one city. And the easiest city to do that with is Minsk. And then you get a rolling set of six isolated attacks on the city in severe weather. It's a lot like attempting to take a fortress. It's usually successful. By the end of September, the Soviets were threatening to finish the Turks. They had the German unit pinned and were adjacent to Siswas with the Turks on just three points of national will. The only option I can see to try and hold this is to cycle the Luftwaffe units in from Odessa to Turkey. Due to home defence, only one of them at a time can actually be in Turkey, so I have to fly it over, run its sorties, use its last sortie to fly it back, fly the next one over, run its sorties, use its last sortie to fly it back, and so on. It just pays off. The Turks hold into the bad weather and up to January for the Soviet collapse. With the Soviet collapse, I play the standard response and use the unlimited success in Spain. Spain, after Italy, is the single most important minor power and is often overlooked when players first start playing the game. The desire to get Spain as an ally was part of the decision making I made about going for uh, Russia early. I'd have preferred to move in July, but one of the things it did by going in May was eliminate a pro-Western marker. The result is a 2 in 3 chance of activating Spain, which I get. And we'll save the Battle of France for the next episode. For now, here endeth the lesson.